We got some absolute bombshells this week in Wheel of Time news. There was already plenty to talk about, but an interview from Empire Podcast with Rafe Judkins dropped where he not only explained a good bit from Season 1, but gave some great hints and ideas about what we would be seeing in Season 2 of The Wheel of Time. Now combine all of that with new filming locations, an update on Season 2 filming, a tour of Jordan Studios from one of the cast members, and some news about Season 3, and it's a full week for the news. Also, I'll be announcing the new name for the Monday Live Show, announcing the winner of the $25 gift card to shopwheeloftime.com, and I'll be announcing a new contest where you can get a map of your choice. All of that and more today on the Weekly Wheel of Time News. Now before we get into the video, everybody smash that like button to help the algorithm like this channel more and appease the YouTube gods. Subscribe to the channel if you want more Wheel of Time related content. Let's go ahead and hit the spoiler rating for the video. Today's video is going to carry a spoiler rating of red with major spoilers through book three of the Wheel of Time, The Dragon Reborn. Also, spoilers for the first season of the show. If you haven't watched the first season or read the books to book three, watch at your own risk. So let's kick all of this off with an update on the status of season three of the show. As most of you know, last week a number of publications announced that the Wheel of Time had been picked up for a third season after news that Wheel of Time was the most watched television show in Amazon history and the most watched new streaming show of 2021. It turns out that all of that was a bit premature. Deadline changed their article that they had released on the Criminal Minds reboot that had stated that Wheel of Time had been picked up for two more seasons. It now says just for next season, which is the current one they're filming. I can also independently confirm that season three has not officially been picked up by Amazon, although it is likely to in the future based on results from the first season. So just so everybody has the most current information, no season three just yet. Next up, we have a new filming location for season two of The Wheel of Time. This comes courtesy of Watseries.com. Watseries is reporting that the Chateau Korlova Karuna a chateau in the Czech Republic that was used for filming and that one of the halls inside of the chateau, pictured right now on screen, was used in filming for an unknown part. Now what's interesting about the Watt series report on this is that they said a certain marble seat that appeared in season one was spotted on the set. Now obviously, this is probably a reference to the Omerlin seat, which begs the question as to why the seat itself would be in a different chamber than the Hall of the Tower, especially considering they already have a set for that. If they had not mentioned that this prop was in the first season, I might have assumed we were either getting a shot of the Crystal Throne in Sean Chan, or maybe Barthana's seat at his manor, but that doesn't seem likely or what they're referring to here. Now the room is beautiful, but it has a mystery as to what they could be using it for, somehow connected to the Omerlin seat? Let me know in the comments of the video what you think this room is for and why the seat would be a part of it. Now, on the topic of filming for season two, we have some more information on the status of filming. Again, according to Wattseries.com, it looks like season two filming should be wrapping up here in March, giving us roughly a month left for principal photography. Sanaa Hamri, who is the director that's directing episodes three, four, seven, and eight, noted that she had one more month in Prague in her Instagram story. So, one month left. What does that mean for production? Well, the earlier they finish filming, the more time they have to work on post-production and fix anything they don't like. I want them to take as much time as they need. And from the other reports we've received, it appears that we're going to be getting a much bigger VFX budget for season two of the show, which again would be a part of that post-production. And based on when season two might release, which we're going to talk about here in a bit, it does appear that they're going to have a longer period of time for post-production, something I'm actually looking forward to. I'm glad they're taking the time to do this right. So Amazon released a short video on Twitter that is led by none other than Alvaro Borte, the actor that plays Loghain in the series. And he walks us through the White Tower set as they film a scene of Loghain before the Omelette Sea. Now let me go ahead and play that clip for you and then we'll talk about it. Welcome to the White Tower. Hey, And here you are. The White Tower is the place where it's gonna be the trial for all the games. Bring the false dragon. That was my rap. This kind of emotional has been such an amazing treat. I hope that all the fans understand what we wanted to do with this kind of different game. 
it was made from the respect and admiration for the books and for the coward. And action! They forget the dragon is just as likely to save the world as break it. All right, so calling that a tour might be a bit much, but it was a bit of the behind the scenes stuff and it was pretty cool if you ask me. And of course, I have some comments. First of all, I love the size of the sets. I would assume that this is on the set at Jordan Studios where they built the sound stages for the show. The Hall of the Tower and the White Tower itself are sets within that studio. And this is our first glimpse of the inside of that. Now it's sort of amazing how intricate these places are and really how large they are just for filming a few scenes inside of them. I loved hearing from Alvaro on how they're portraying Loghain in the show. I really loved his performance and I'm excited to see more of him in future seasons. These types of behind the scenes clips are extremely fun for me and I hope we get lots and lots more of them. To me, it helps with some of the whys behind the decisions they made and that makes it more immersive for me. Now, speaking of immersive though, the Wheel of Time books are quite immersive. One of the best ways that you can reread them or even read them for the first time is in audiobook form. Now hearing the pages brought to life by a talented reader really adds to the experience and Michael Kramer and Kate Redding, the readers of the Wheel of Time audiobooks, are two of the absolute best. Fortunately, the sponsor of this video, audible.com, is going to give you a free audiobook that you can check it out for yourself. Audible is the world's largest supplier of audiobooks and the service is really simple. You get a book a month for a really low monthly fee which is far cheaper than buying the audiobooks one at a time. Now, if you head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash Nablus, you can get a free audiobook of your choice just for checking out the service, and you don't have to pay anything at all or keep the service if you don't want it. The best part is, is just by doing that, you help the channel as well. Again, head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash Nablus, sign up for the free trial, get your book. Now let's get back to the news. All right. Let's hit the main event today. This past week, Wheel of Time showrunner Rafe Judkins gave an interview to the Empire podcast that covered stuff from season one, bits and pieces from season two, and some other cool stuff. The podcast is behind a paywall, so I can't play the clips for you without permission from the podcast, but I will break down what I think the main takeaways from his comments were, and I'll have the podcast linked in the description if you want to listen to yourself. It's certainly worth a listen. It was fairly cheap. I would do it if I were. Now, the first major topic that Rafe talked about that I had some takeaways from was the effect that COVID had on the production. Most of what he said we have already heard from other sources, but there was some new stuff in there as well, and it was fun to hear him confirm some of it. He talked about how COVID is still an ongoing issue, and it makes things a logistical nightmare. Now, I'm reading into his words here, but things are certainly not as bad as they were last year or even the previous year for the production, but they still have quite a bit of different restrictions with actors flying in from different places mandatory quarantines that delay shoots or make the schedule have to change and they have to accommodate. I'm sure they're still dealing with other restrictions as well. And that's just going on right now. So he didn't get into detail about the final episodes of the first season and the effect of COVID on those episodes, mainly because I think he's trying to avoid making excuses for it. But he did talk a bit about the writing process and how he and Amanda Kate Schumann, who's one of the main writers on the show, were forced to basically pivot on the fly and rewrite the final episodes. A good bit of what they had planned for various characters, including Egwene and Nynaeve, Perrin, and obviously Matt, were completely changed, and we did not get their original intention when they wrote it the first time. The Perrin and Pot on Fane scene was meant to be with Matt. He didn't make excuses, though, and I think he spent most of the time talking about how that's just a part of making television shows, and that you have to be flexible and deal with what you're given sometimes. And to a point, I agree with them. Regardless of the reasons, they are still responsible for creating something that fans want to watch and crafting the story. My gripes here would have more to do with Amazon than Rafe directly, as I have no doubts that Amazon was pushing for completion so that they could release the show rather than giving them more time. That being said, we really don't know what happened with this. The other factors that can force them to just finish the show uh, would be the actor schedules. They don't have 100% control over all the schedules of the various actors, and they have time frames they have to meet too. So it's possible that they couldn't even bring all the actors back to reshoot again, even if they wanted to. Anyways, one thing is for sure, COVID did change the story for the ending of season one. Now, on some of the specific changes to season one from the book, Rafe did talk about them a little bit. He said that Amazon handed him a 250-page document at the beginning of the process that mapped out what book readers 
and book readers who put the books down at some point while reading it, and people who started the books and then just stopped halfway through the first book. It explained what those readers' complaints were and the things they liked from the first books, all of that, and Rafe and the team used that to help inform the directions they went with the early writing. For example, he talks about how readers said that Matt's character does not really have any development or substance until book three, which is something I completely agree with for the most part, and I think most readers tend to say that. Most new readers are always wondering why Matt is so hyped up by the fan community based on his portrayal in those first couple books, so that makes sense. So they took that feedback and they tried to give Matt independent motivations and desires and wanted the darkness or the conflict in him to not only come from the dagger, but actually be something that was native to him and it would be exacerbated by the dagger. So I was actually a fan of how Matt was portrayed in the first season, for the most part. But regardless of whether you agree with the changes to Matt's family or some of his backstory, I think it's good at least to hear some of the thinking behind why they did the things they did. As a part of making changes like that, the driving motivation Rafe talks about was to set up Matt and Perrin's arcs earlier in the story. They wanted Perrin's struggle with violence to be center stage. Again, I agree with it in concept. I'm not really on board with him axing his wife, both literally and figuratively. But Rafe also spoke of the deliberate concealment of who the Dragon Reborn was during the first season. They believed that the question of who the Dragon Reborn was would pull in new watchers and it would help people new to the series understand what it means to be the Dragon Reborn before they fully know who it is. As you see, all of the characters kind of wrestling with the weight of whether or not it could be them. Now, one thing I thought was cool from this was that he described Moraine's quest to find the Dragon Reborn as based on the real life searches for the Dalai Lama and how they look for a soul that's reborn in a new body everywhere. This is something that I think Robert Jordan actually based the story around anyway, so I thought that was very cool. Now, obviously, as a part of trying to conceal the identity of the Dragon Reborn, they were forced to change the narrative structure, like leaving out Tam's fever dreams until later, and they thought it largely worked. Now, on that front, I actually agree. I think it did work. It did hurt other elements of the story, but, but by and large, I agree with the thought to conceal who the Dragon Reborn was until the very end, especially for new viewers. It was the main thing that my family was talking about at Thanksgiving, trying to decide who it was. So that obviously worked. As for the other parts from season one, the ending with Egwene healing Nynaeve, Rafe said that it was misinterpreted by fans and that it was mostly their fault for not making it more clear. He said that Nynaeve was not dead, and that the idea that you cannot heal death is very much a part of the magic system and the lore of the rules, Egwene was just meant to be shown healing Nynaeve. Additionally, he said the original script called for Egwene to heal Nynaeve using herbs and things that she learned in the very first episode of the show, but COVID messed up that plot line, and so they did it with Changeling instead. Now, that statement had me scratching my head thinking about how COVID could have made it so Egwene couldn't heal Nynaeve in a traditional way. The only thing I could think of was is that they couldn't get the two actresses together, and so they did that with CGI. So I went back and watched that, and it doesn't appear that they're not there together. Like, they look like they're very much acting together. So I'm not really sure how COVID affected that shot, but maybe there is something that we don't know about. Rafe did mention that burning out is a concept that they wanted to establish in the show, and that wielding that much of the power has consequences. He said that Nynaeve and Egwene will deal with those consequences of holding that much of the power for the rest of the series. Now, to me, that was sort of the implication that Nynaeve's block comes from this, but we'll have to wait and find out. Rafe also talked a bit about Maureen and Swan's relationship. He said that the oath Maureen took to obey Swan was meant to be taken as sort of a marriage vow, and the statement of devotion. He said something which I think was kind of cryptic. He was asked if the wording of Moraine's oath will give her more freedom to maneuver around. And Rafe answered that he thought it may give her more or less room than Moraine thought to maneuver based on the plot. So I thought that was interesting and it's clearly a setup for something they're gonna do. He was also asked about where they went to meet in the hut and he would not answer that question fully. He just said that they used the special Terran Grial to give them a secret place to meet and that it was based on in-world mechanisms. To me, this was confirmation that they visited the world of dreams in some form, although I don't think he meant it to be that. That's just my interpretation and what he said reinforces it. Uh, it would not be a completely secret place if it was traveling, and there were other sides that it was dreaming, so I think that's what it was. The last major thing he hit on for season one was that all of the dialogue between Luz Theron Telemon and La Trapose in episode eight, the cold open, was intentional, and they did not misspeak at all. Now, this is Rafe really doubling down on their direction for this, even after... This is one of my main criticisms, and I know I share that criticism with other people. I did not like that dialogue. I didn't feel like it had the right stakes. But it does make me wonder if there's more to it than we realize.
He implied that there's something that they're going to explore more out of this. So I'm hopeful that it will make more sense later on, but for me, that scene was kind of a dumb. But let's talk about the season two stuff that he mentioned. First off, he talks about how Donal Finn is absolutely killing it as Matt. Rafe said that season two will follow books two and three, which is confirmation that that's what they're adapting. He said that the lighthearted and fun nature of Matt in book three is how Donal plays the character. And the scripting for season two seems to follow that. So is that confirmation, at least in some part, that Matt's arc in season two will follow his book three arc? The fact that he's in Tarvalin at the end of season one appears to imply that for sure. Now, he spoke specifically to Rand's season two arc as well. He mentions that Rand will follow most of the character beats and meet most of the characters he does meet in books two and three, just that they're going to be all blended together. Now, this does imply in some way that his arc will remain pretty similar to his book arc, just that they're going to try to move more of those events into the same places to save time which is completely understandable considering the need to combine parts of the books. Given that we also know Barthana's manner is happening, that also adds to that. It makes sense. Rafe also mentioned that they aged up Rand a bit. So book two Rand's naivety and immaturity is going to be a little bit less prominent as they need to just kind of advance his character faster. So again, this isn't something I have a problem with, at least until I see it play out. In terms of power creep and the need of feeling to go bigger than the battle at the end of season one, Rafe said that that's a part of the books as well. He said that the later battles and things will be much larger and that they're prepared for that. And I hope he's right. That's one of my concerns. When asked about Moraine's arc in season two and whether she was stilled or shielded, he wouldn't answer. And he just said that it's a major part of her season two arc and that she learns that more of her power comes from her intelligence. He said in regards to the Shan Chan that he wanted them to feel like they came out of nowhere and they leave watchers wondering who the hell they were. He also mentioned that the Aiel, in the same way that the Aes Sedai were brought into the story uh, sooner with more prominence, would play a larger role in the second season than we might think they would. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing some more Aiel. I love the Aiel. He mentioned that Avienda had for sure been cast, which is also very cool to hear. Lastly, he did say that the wait for season two might be longer than you think, and that it would come after Lord of the Rings, and that there would be a gap between the two series. He sounded as though we'd either get the release around the same time as the season one, and I would say that's optimistic, but more than likely 2023, which I'm absolutely fine with if it means they have all the time they need for post-production or reshoots or anything else. He did mention that he thought we would be getting a ton of content between now and then, though. So those were Rafe's comments. Let me know what you think in the comments of this video. I want to hear all about it. So last week's contest was to come up with a name for the Monday live show, and we have one. Multiple people actually suggested this name for the new live show. And so I'm going to pick from one of those people that will win the contest. But I guess before I do that, let me first announce what the show will be called. The Monday live show henceforth will be called The Dark Friend Social. Now, obviously, I'm more than a dark friend. And any guest I bring on, you're going to be a dark friend too. So deal with it. We'll be social. Dark Friend Social. Now, I mentioned that I have multiple people that suggested that. So I had to pick a winner from those people. Sorry if you were one of the people that gave me that name and then you didn't win. Sorry. But the winner is April S. April, message me on Discord or on Twitter and I will get you out your $25 gift card to shopweedlifetime.com. But now for this week's contest. And we're going to go big this time. I'm giving away a large map of your choice on shopweedlifetime.com. Here's what you need to do to register. Obviously, like always, you need to like this video and make sure you are subscribed to the channel. Second, I want you to watch my latest chapter breakdown video on tellings of the wheels, that's chapter nine, and leave a comment and like on that video. And the comment on that video that I want is simple. Do you like these types of videos and you want me to make more of them? Or is it not something you care about? I want you to be honest, my feelings are not gonna get hurt. That video is linked in this video's description and will be linked on the screen at the end of this video as well. There are some of you that love those chapter breakdowns, but they never get very many views, so I don't want to waste my time with them if people don't like them. But it also could be that YouTube just isn't telling you about them. So I want to get your input. I want you to watch it and tell me if you think it's good or if it's bad. So to summarize, subscribe to the channel, like this video, then go to the Tellings of the Wheel chapter summary video, like it, and leave a comment on whether you would watch more of those types of videos or not. Pretty simple and then you can win a map. So thank you to all of you. Special thank you to my patrons. You are the folks that make these videos possible and you can see those folks on the screen right now. If you wanna support the channel and you like the content that I'm making, please consider supporting the channel in some way. Patreon is the best. Also, here is a link to those chapter summary videos and some other content that you might like. Thank you for watching and until next time, peace out.